Joining us now, a familiar face, Rachel Maddow. She is the host of the new podcast. Rachel Maddow presents Deja News. The first episode, which you just heard a preview of, is now available and already. Guess what number? Okay, audience, guess what number it is right now on Apple Podcasts. It's been out almost a day. <laughs> almost a day. What number could it possibly be? One. One, Melissa Ryerson, my boss, just told me that in my ear. Number one on Apple Podcasts. So what I want to know, when did you know and when did your parents know that they were bringing up a daughter with a perfect podcast voice? <laughs> no, because it's a special thing. The podcast voice, it's this special version of kind of an NPR voice plus. There's this, this kind of an extra wisdom note in it, and, and <laughs> there's, it's a really special thing. I um, will check with my parents now to see if yeah. they have yet become aware of this. This might be the first time they're mm -hmm. hearing it. I think lots of different voices work in podcasts. Yeah, but, I, there's, the, but, there's, but there's ideals, you know? Well, you know that, there's that, well, we won't get into it. I will say, I think the secret, I think the secret sauce with Deja News is in the logo, there's that little groundhog. And we never say anything about the groundhog. He's just there as a tacit metaphor for Groundhog Day, for mm -hmm. things being a reminder. Mm -hmm. I feel like the groundhog is the whole explanation for our success. My voice has nothing to do with it. So when I heard the title, Deja News, before I listened to it mm -hmm. and, and loved all 33 minutes of it, I didn't want to know anything about it. I, it's like I, it's the greatest way I can see a movie or something is to know nothing about it, which is hard to do. Right? It's hard yeah. to not know anything about it. Uh, but when this was slipped to me secretly by you over the weekend, <laughs> day, I got it early. I got it 24 hours early. Um, I thought, Deja News, oh, so is that like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Like, we're going back to a thing, and you go, it, it, I, but it, it, it's better than that. It's, it's so much better than that. It, it's taking things in the past that teach us something about our present, and you can be surprised how far, how far in the past and how far away from right here they might be. But they still are enough of an allegory for what we're going through now, something in our contemporary politics or contemporary news, that they can help us see the dynamics at work, see the potential implications, see how long they might um, last and resonate. That's the thing that really is interesting to me is I like history. I think it's helpful for understanding, you know, the overall context of what we're going through. But I also think it can give us predictive assistance in terms of what's likely to happen next. And in this first episode, which is about something that was very much like January 6th, um, the, the shock to me was how it resonated for decades. And the people who were involved in it, who were on the side of the January 6th attackers in this mm -hmm. other instance, really helped write a kind of a fake history, a false history, a revisionist history of what happened that they still celebrate generations later, decades yeah. later. Those people who come up with false histories about things, they do it for a reason. And if they, if they stick with it long enough, they can convince all sorts of people that things went down the way they did not go down. So, I, you know, it's this, much of the story is set in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought I knew something about it. And I, by the way, I claim a knowledge of uh, a knowledge level of about zero for most decades in American history, never mind in history history. Uh, but the 30s is one of them I thought I knew something about, mostly because of my uh, study of uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And, mm. and what you always get in that is, you know, Roosevelt and Hitler are rising at the same time. Sure, right. And as soon as you hear the word Hitler on the other side of the Atlantic, there's no one else you pay attention to in the 1930s. You don't go, hey, what was going on in France? And never yeah. mind, never mind. <laughs> Listen to this. Listen to what Hitler was doing. Right. You know? So I had no idea. That well, this... yeah, I mean, Hit I mean, you don't even pay attention to, like, Mussolini, who no. was in power for a no, dozen no, no. years before. Yeah. I mean, Hitler, like, kind of wanted to be like Mussolini, but as soon as Hitler becomes Hitler, we forget about him. Yeah, and in France, I mean, one of the things about this attack on their parliament in 1934, February 6, 1934, it's very much like the attack on January 6th that we had here. Theirs succeeded. They had a center-left government that was taking power. There was a transfer of power happening. The violent right-wing mob attacked the center of power and actually did stop the transfer of power. And instead, they got a pro-fascist right-wing government installed instead. It's as if January 6th succeeded. And then the long, the, the I guess the medium-length tail of that into 
the World War II era is that when the Nazis did invade France, they needed collaborators. They needed a really right wing pro fascist government to take over and collaborate with the Nazis. Well, they picked all the guys who had been installed after their January 6th. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, like all uh, great movies, great stories, the way you tell this has real suspense, real tension. It's scary. Yeah. You feel like, oh boy, really bad stuff can happen. But what I came out of it with, and, I, and I'm not sure what the author's intent is, and by the way, I'm never really sure that author's intent matters. The, mm. the, what one takes out of it is up to, that's our job. That's yeah. what we the reader do or we the audience do. What I took out of it was very, very positive. What mm. was how France came to that kind of brink, right? And where they went after that. And post-World War II, how unified they were. Uh, this, this, thing drifted into World War II yeah. because the people involved in it then became basically the, the version of the French government that was cooperating with the Nazi German occupiers. Uh, but looked at from the, say, the Churchill and the Roosevelt perspective, which, by the way, is the only way I've ever been looking at this <laughs> because of the bias and the way our history focuses on it. The Vichy government, those people, they, 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 you could never really take them seriously in the mm. history that we read because it's like, of course, they're out of a job when this is over, you know? Yeah. And, and so, but the recovery, which you really, I think, would date from 1945, 46 onward, was, is a very positive story. They regained story. their democracy. Yeah, very yes. positive. And in the immediate aftermath of their successful version of January 6th, when the center left government was blocked from taking power. They put in this pro-fascist body and said there was another really interesting reaction in the sort of just the first few years after that happened, which is that all of the people on the left and all the people in the center who had had all sorts of differences with each other, who were always fighting each other like cats and dogs, finally realized like, oh, wait, actually, there's an authoritarian fascist threat that wants to destroy yeah. all of us. Yeah. Let's put aside our differences, form a big anti-fascist coalition government where we everything else that dis, that we disagree on is less important than us standing against fascism and us standing for democracy and they do and that that sense of perspective they got from that brush with democratic death um, is also i think something that resonates i mean it's something to think about in terms of what the effect is of rising authoritarian and pro-fascist movements in democracies around the world including our own yeah, and, and those people uh, who rose up against have their counterparts in w what was the Republican Party. The, you know, Charlie Sykes, for example, who appears on this network, who was a very strong conservative Republican before Trump came in, and he looked at that, and as did many, many, many others, prominent Republicans, and say, oh, no, no, I, I, I can't be, I, I have to oppose that. Whatever I do, I have to oppose that. Yeah, and I mean, there's no, you can't make an analogy between the Nazis and anybody, and you can't even really make an analogy, a direct one, between, you know, French fascists and other, but you can see when there is a shock, particularly a shock from the right, because a shock from the right in these cases wants to undo the democratic system. If everybody else in the democratic system can recognize it as that, it can be a galvanizing sort of patriotic thing to rally behind. Let's save our country, save our democratic way of doing things and get along for the sake of doing that, even if we want to go back to fighting with each other. And later. for anyone who was thinking you couldn't possibly organize one of these things without Twitter and social media, all the details about how they did organize yeah. this in French. How do they, they do <laughs> it in French? How do you organize anything yeah. in French? How do you do that in French? <laughs> uh, 